from Mega North America. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar event today, Technology and Corporate Agility, Making the Partnership Work. Uh, we're going to wait a couple of minutes to allow people to go through the login process. So in the meantime, I'd like to introduce you to our speaker for the day, Wendy Melarano. Uh, Wendy, how are you today? I'm good. How are you, Mike? I'm fantastic. Thank you for asking. So while we wait, uh, I understand you and the Business Architecture Guild were recently in Austin, Texas. Uh, how was that event? We were. It was good. It was a actually a bit of an experiment. So we partnered up with the OMG and had an innovation workshop basically where a number of collaborative teams got together around various topics of business architecture and presented and was very interactive and I think a, a good example of the co-creation that can happen in a community. So it was a good thing and uh, we'll be doing it next year again. Oh, that's, that's great. Yeah. And so the the attendees at the event uh, seemed to respond well to how it flowed and the way the, the sessions went and, like you said, the interaction was strong? They did. They loved the interaction. I mean, it literally, we had 20 minutes of presenting in every session and then we were up and whiteboards and trying things and giving input and having interactive panels. So the interactive format went over really well, really well. So it's good. Yeah, it's a maturing this, community. Uh, in this day and age, right, I think just people, that's the expectation. I think they've wanted it forever, Got right? It. Going back decades, yep. everybody's wanted. Nobody wants to sit, you know, in the back and yep. watch it like it's on TV. But uh, now that I think of events are doing this, the social media allows mm -hmm. uh, the customer base to do that with uh, anyone that provides any service or product, right, to the community, B2B or B2C, whatever mm -hmm. it be. So I'm glad Absolutely. that format worked well. Yeah, I think, and um, I think it's, yeah. The type, that's the type of thing where I think people want to come back to that because they mm -hmm. understand that their contribution gets considered yep. as part of the group, right? Yep, yep. And I think it's a sign of the discipline maturing as well, right? Because it's now in the hands of a community that are doing things together. Yeah, exactly right. And that's that's what it's all about, you know, the collaboration mm -hmm. uh, in 2014 going into 2015. It's, it's no longer some some decision maker in an ivory tower by yep. him or herself, but it's uh, it's a group effort. That's, that's exciting. You bet. Um, yep. To those that are joining in, we're just waiting another minute or two to allow people to go through the login process and then we'll begin the actual presentation. So yeah, Austin, any, what else is on board for the Business Architecture Guild for the rest of 2014? Loads of things. Um, so of course, always new body of knowledge, which is called the BizBoc. There's always new content there. We're planning the next uh, conference, which is going to be in Reston, also co-sponsored with the OMG. Um, and we've recently announced a certification program. So there will be a beta in fourth quarter, and then um, in Q1, it'll be available for public. So loads of things on the plate. Again, all good signs, though, I think, of how the discipline is maturing. Yeah, I've been a big fan of the, the Business Architecture Guild for a long time, and it's exciting to see, uh, it, while it's always done well and it's grown well, but to see mm -hmm. this much traction and, and growth is yep. very exciting. Yep, it is. Great. Yeah. All right, at this point, um, I think people look like they're in their seats, and so mm -hmm. uh, we'll get started. So, hello everyone. My name is Michael Hebda. As I mentioned earlier, I'm the Marketing Manager for Mega North America. I want to welcome you to our webinar event today, Technology and Corporate Agility, Making the Partnership Work. Before we begin, I'd like to direct your attention to the GoToWebinar toolbar on the right-hand side of your screen. To avoid distractions, the audience will be muted throughout the webcast. However, we'd like to encourage you to ask questions. And to do this, there is a Questions tab on your Goto toolbar. If you have any questions or comments about tech-related issues, and of course, any questions related to the presentation, please submit them through the questions tab on the toolbar, and we'll do our best to address as many as possible. Uh, Tech-related questions we'll take care of as they come in, and presentation questions uh, we will address during the Q&A session following the presentation. Also, there will be two poll questions during the presentation. We'd love your perspective on these questions as it helps us to shape the conversation and give us clearer insight into the day-to-day -day activities in the industry. Uh, so, again, if uh, be as engaging or as engaged as possible during that, we'd appreciate that. Now I'd like to take an opportunity to tell you a little about today's speaker. 
Wendy Melorano is a Business Architecture Practice Director at STA Group, LLC. In addition to building the practice, she is responsible for managing Fortune 500 client accounts and working hands-on to help them develop business architecture in support of major change initiatives, typically enterprise transformations. She also has extensive experience helping clients to build their own business architecture practices. Wendy focuses on pioneering new business architecture practices and methods and oversees their real-world application. Wendy is a co-founder and board member of the Business Architecture Guild, a board member of the Business Architects Association, and co-chair of the OSEG GRC Architect Group. She also teaches on behalf of the Business Architecture Institute. And with no further delay, I will now pass the spotlight to Wendy Melorano. Excellent. Thanks, Michael. Really appreciate the opportunity to share today. So today's topic is this idea of business agility, and I'll share a few key approaches for achieving it. So while this is a huge topic unto itself, I'd like to define how we'll be referring to it today. So agility within a business context is the ability of an organization to rapidly adapt to market and environmental changes in productive and cost-effective ways. It's about responding to change and doing so with pace. And we can say that business agility is the outcome of organizational intelligence, something really important for us to have that we're going to talk more about. And as we know, agility doesn't just happen, particularly in large organizations. It's really something that we need to be intentional about and design in, and we'll talk about some key ways to do that today. So before we go any further, let's do a quick poll just to get to know each other. Uh, so Mike, I'll let you put up the poll there. I would love to understand what sort of initiatives are you all working on in your organizations, and check all of them that apply. This will give us context for the type of challenges you may all be facing. Go ahead and share your input. OK. I can see a lot of activity bubbling up and down and percolating <laughs> as people make their selections. Glad to see this happening. Very good. And to any audience members that uh, looked away for a moment, poll question. <laughs> Love to get your feedback as well and include you in the results. Numbers are still going up. Very, very good. Maybe we'll give this uh, a 10 second countdown. Nine, eight, <laughs> almost there, right? Five, four, three, two, one. All right, here we go. I'm going to close this and then do this. So here are the results. Wendy, what do you, what do you think? Excellent. I think the results are, are what we would expect. At the end of the day, we're all doing a lot of really huge things. 60% of people are doing customer experience. 69% of us are doing enterprise level transformations. Over 50% are doing digital transformations and a lot of governance risk and compliance going on. There's just 14% and other, which does tell me that we're all involved in the big stuff above. So I do hope that the things I'm going to share here today are extremely relevant and knowing the things that we're all working on. So fantastic. Thanks, Mike. Cool. So let's talk about a common reality that we're all facing today. So we experience a lot of growth and success throughout our histories, right? We've served customers. We competed. We grew. We may have gone through mergers and acquisitions. We succeeded in running our businesses and doing it well. After all, we're all still here. And a lot of the initial growth probably, or, or more recent growth, I'll say, was fueled by things like globalization, internet, the move towards digital. But this wonderful growth and success, which happened very quickly to some of us, led to some conditions which we now face. We have bigger, more complex and interrelated organizations, both internally and with external partners. We have insufficient collaboration across the organization. We often approach things like strategy and planning and decision making and execution in silos. And not only might we be structured that way, but our motivation mechanisms may be enforcing that type of behavior. 
task. And during all of this change, we didn't necessarily have the time to write things down as we should have, so there's probably a lot of institutional knowledge in people's heads. Some of them may be retirement eligible, or we may have written things down, but we did so in our own areas, and so as a result, we don't have an enterprise view of what we're doing and where. And sometimes when businesses grow in pieces, they sort of evolve and, and have an accidental business design is what I like to call it. And so this produces results such as limited visibility and transparency about what's going on in an organization, or fragmented and inconsistent customer experiences. Our silos often show through to the customer. Um, I don't know if you've ever had a situation where you tried to change your address with a company and you called one area only to find out that that area doesn't talk to the other areas so you keep getting mailed to the old address. Or maybe you've experienced having to be a messenger between two areas of a company and shuffling around forms because they don't talk to each other. But at the end of the day, Customers look at us as one company, and they expect, expect us to act like one, and we're all customers ourselves, so we can sympathize with that. And behind these fragmented customer experiences, there's usually a lot of redundancy in capabilities and processes and people and technology, which is, of course, very expensive extra work to maintain and really doesn't fully utilize the people power that we have and what they could be doing. All of this complexity, redundancy, lack of organizational intelligence makes it difficult to react to the pace of change required by the external environment. We don't have the agility that we need. And in a lot of organizations, there's a low success rate in implementing strategies well enough or quickly enough. You've all probably seen statistics like, you know, 10% of companies succeed in executing their vision, or 74% of today's business executives have a digital strategy, but only 50 percent of them believe that the company has the skills and the capabilities to execute on it. And this, for some of us, is the state that we're in as we've moved into the age of the customer, where they're really in the driver's seat, and the rate of change we have to deal with internally and externally has now accelerated. I like this quote here because I think it summarizes some key points. Even if you have a perfect strategy and a competitively advantaged business model, it will still fail if the organization isn't aligned from strategy down to execution. And that's what we're going to be talking more about today, and that's what I'm going to show you an example of today. If we don't know how to execute on the strategy or if we're working at cross purposes, we just can't be as successful in the end. So I'd like to illustrate an, an analogy, and we'll go through an ideal situation and then a not-so-ideal situation to business change. And the analogy I'm going to use is an office move. I think it's actually spot on to illustrate some things that happen, and my company has recently gone through a move, so this is a topic familiar to me uh, in recent memory. And then later on in the presentation, I'll walk you through an example of a customer experience transformation that applies the ideal approach that I'm going to share here. So in this situation, let's say we work at a company, and it's a big company, so we have a big office we're in. We are going to expand. So good news, our business has been successful. We are going to have more people, more business. We need to move to bigger office space. So in the ideal situation, first thing we would do would be contact an office manager who probably owns and stewards the floor plan. We would look at that floor plan to figure out what sort of rooms do we have, where are they located, which people and assets are contained within them. We likely have offices and cubes and meeting rooms and lunch rooms and IT rooms and so on. And it's very easy to understand at a glance what is where and what we're doing because it's written down and it's in a visual blueprint. Then, once we figure out what we have in place, seems like a smart idea to figure out where are we going. So we pull out, again, the floor plan for the new office, and we map out now where are our people and our assets going to go. And then we have uh, a view of what our future state's going to look like. And of course, it was very easy to do all this because we're just comparing our two plans together that we already have in place. We're already written down. 
and then to move into action, we create a plan to get everything moved towards that future state we mapped out. We form a move team that's going to organize things, communicate the plan. Together they decide we're going to outsource. Um, they obtain packing supplies for everybody, give instructions so we know what to do with our boxes, communicate downtime over the weekend, and then we do it. Right? Everybody moves, we pack, we unpack, we're back in business. And the end result is a seamless transition to the business and the customer and efficiency from both a time and cost perspective. So that all seems really obvious. That's kind of how everybody moves. But now let's look at a not so ideal scenario that could happen if we didn't have our affairs in order. Same trigger. We need to move. We're expanding. But in this case, we don't have a documented floor plan. And guess what? The office manager that created the office five years ago has left. And no one's responsible for even knowing what rooms we all have or what people and assets are in each. Everybody basically comes to work, interacts with the people around them. Some people don't even realize we house our own IT in our office. So somebody volunteers to do a room-by-room -room inventory to at least understand and write down what we have. As far as determining where we're going, it's decided that it would take a lot of time to figure out where everybody needs to go in the new floor plan. By all means, look at how long the room-by-room -room inventory took. Let's not spend all of this time planning. Let's just get executing and get things moving faster. Everybody assumes that they have the same picture in their mind about what the new office looks like, even though no one's seen the plan, because it's an office is an office, right? When it comes time to determine how we're going to do that move, it's decided that since our areas are pretty siloed in the office right now and everyone's unique and knows their area best, everyone's going to plan and execute their own moves on their own. So, of course, a few companies decide to contract different move companies. Every area is running out getting supplies, doing redundant work. Nobody, nobody is labeling boxes. And they all decide to move on different schedules. So. In this case, as you can imagine, the actual move is a disaster. It takes a very long time. Some people move over before others. As others keep arriving, they are walking around claiming offices. Things are reshuffling. Boxes are arriving out of order. People are trying to get back to work. They may have a desk, but no computer or no supplies. Some things are broken, missing. And in all of this chaos, we have a group of clients coming on Friday for a, a site visit who are now going to be exposed to our chaos. So the outcome in this case is significant disruption to both the customer and the business, and downtime in costs that was absolutely unnecessary if we had performed this in a coordinated way. So I laid out this example for a reason. And when you look at the situation from an office move, it's pretty obvious to all of us that the first scenario is the right way to do it. However, when it comes to executing on strategies and ideas in our big organizations with a lot of people coming together, sometimes we resemble aspects of that second scenario. So when you apply these concepts to your own organization, and many of us are in the same situation because of our own growth and success, which is a good thing, are you more like the seamless move that we covered on the top or more like the disruptive one on the bottom? And some questions you can consider are, do you know what you're doing across the organization and where? Do you know what capabilities are being performed and how, what people are doing, what the supporting technology is doing? Do you know where the redundancy, conflicts, or missing integration points are, particularly those that would be seen by a customer? When changes are needed, when someone says, we got to move, whether it's strategic, operational, or legislative, can you quickly and completely understand the impacts of it and bring people together across products and business areas for a common understanding of the future state big picture like we did on the future state um, office plan? Are you truly doing top-down planning, or is every product and business area working to its own plan, which is basically just rolled up into one big plan, even though some of the work may be redundant at odds, and at the end of the day, we don't really know if 
all that work is going to get us to our ultimate organizational goals. When it comes time to change, and it really matters whether that's to meet customer demand or to compete or to survive, are you ready to move? I think is a good question to ask. So the opportunity then in all of this, and this is the part that I think is so exciting, is that you can actually make the strategy to execution process a competitive advantage. This is the ability to implement change, to move your strategy and direction into action quickly and in an orchestrated way. That's what this agility is about that I'm talking about today. And if you didn't think before that this could be a competitive advantage for you, I invite you to consider thinking about it in that way. And just to clarify, when I say strategy to execution process, in this case, I'm referring to getting the processes, the people, the tools to work together in an integrated way from the strategy function to the translation and design of that strategy for the customer business and IT, down to the planning function, and down to the IT um, and business solution development functions. There's obviously a lot of integration work to get going here, but um, it is possible to achieve over time. So just again, to emphasize, now is truly the time at this point, um, I think in particular, where you can leverage this capability to your advantage and win over competitors who can't do it well enough or fast enough. And I think other organizations aside, if you can do this well, it sets you up for the future because whatever you can dream up and whatever you need to react to in the future can become a reality for you. So. A good strategy to execution process enables you to do things like design your future holistically and then implement it through real top-down planning with continuous delivery. So for example, if you want to do an enterprise transformation in your company, and again, according to our poll, 69% um, of you are doing that, you would understand the objectives of that transformation and then you design a future state across all the business and IT layers, across all products and areas involved in a very collaborative process that brings people together with a common idea of the future state that we're working towards. Again, many organizations do this in pieces, whether they realize it or not. So for example, executives may set some direction or objectives, and then each individual business area or product interprets that in their own way. And what we produce tends to be siloed and sometimes conflicting and just doesn't add up to a good experience for the customer. Once you have that future state defined, you break it into logical pieces sequenced on a very business-focused roadmap. I'm going to show you examples of all this later. And then the individual pieces can execute. And that's a real top-down approach. And then once you have that comprehensive roadmap laid out, you can deliver in pieces over time, delivering value as you go. Again, we'll, we'll look at all this in the example. A good strategy to execution process also enables you to focus investment because you will know what core competencies you're good at and you'll have access to a repository of information that tells you things like if you want to move the needle on this type of performance, whether it's cost savings or customer experience, here are the specific capabilities that will get you those results. And then here's all the other pieces, business and IT in the organization, that are tied to those capabilities. So it becomes very efficient, um, very focused, smart investment. You'll also know exactly what you're doing and where you're doing it so that you don't have to do archaeology every time you want to make a change to your business. So for example, right now, if you, let's say, had to make an important legislation change tomorrow, do you know what capabilities um, you know, that that legislative change is reflected in? Do you know which business rules would be impacted uh, by that? Do you know what IT applications are applying those rules? The cool thing is that once you have these things written down and you have them related to each other, it saves you a tremendous amount of time from having to figure these things out again and again. Basically, sometimes what we do is the equivalent to the move situation I laid out where we had to go door to door to figure out what was happening in our own office. It's just helpful to have this big picture with all the pieces and parts and how they fit together so we can call on them when we need to. 
And when you have all these things written down, it helps you to make better and more informed decisions because you know all of the pieces. And it's not guessing or thinking we know, it's really knowing that we know. And with all of that in place, you can truly create experiences that are integrated for the customer and increase efficiency by streamlining and integrating and reducing the redundancy of capabilities and their associated processes, people, and technology. So at this point, I would like to share with you a real customer experience transformation as an example of putting these ideas in action so it's not just words. But before I do that, a quick poll. So let's uh, bring up the second poll here. And in this one, just share your thoughts on how well does the strategy to execution process work in your organization? Basically, how effective is your organization from taking a strategy or idea, getting it through design and planning, and down into execution for reality? So I see people are voting. Good, we're getting some numbers now. Give it a few more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Outstanding. Here we cool. go. Outstanding. So the results are not surprising, but um, I think a, a reflection of reality. So. Only 6% of folks, and I believe this is a very representative sample, think that this process is very effective for them. 31% are in the middle. You know, it may not be perfect, but it's working. While 63% of us feel that this process is ineffective. It takes too long. It doesn't get the results that we need. So I think that's good, um, a good applicability to exactly what we're talking about here today um, and what I'm going to share next. So. Thank you all for voting. Excellent. So let us now look at an example. And with this example, I'm not going to share all of the every single detail, of course, because it's quite an extensive example. But I'd like to share a process that we went through that leverages the pieces I've laid out so far. Um, so just really get a feel for what, what did we do? What, what, um, what are the steps? This is a real example, like I said, but it's been simplified and sanitized, so just keep that in mind as you're looking at things. Some background for this example was this was a customer experience transformation which was specifically focused on written customer communications across a Fortune 500 enterprise, across the entire enterprise. So that basically included transactional documents that were generated in big systems like bills, correspondence like letters, notifications, basically anything that went to a customer in written format was in the scope of this effort. And as you can imagine, there were millions of these things being generated across the company. So the scope was extremely large to get our arms around. Now, the trigger for this transformation is kind of an interesting story. Basically, one of the top executives dropped off a ream of paper on another executive's desk and said, fix this. We need to fix this. And the ream of paper was all of the communications that that executive had received, because he was also a, a customer of the company, all the communications that he had received within a year. And there was that much paper. So in the end, in this organization, our best customers, or those who had the most products with us, were actually the ones that we treated the worst. The communications were very out of date. The way we provided them was very disconnected, as was the customer service. And the majority of communications were being provided via paper. And even at the time we did this effort, just that itself was way behind where our competitors were. So that was the genesis of the project. It got assigned to an executive who sponsored basically the, the um, transformation, the initiative. And that executive was one person on a customer experience leadership team, which I'm going to talk more about later. And um, that sponsor basically got a business and IT team together. I um, led the team in this particular example, and away we went. So 
here's what we did. We were challenged to do a few things. The first was to create a seamless customer experience, to reduce cost, and specifically as part of that cost reduction to reduce paper. And at the time, there was also an environmental strategy within the company that was driving this objective as well. I like to point out the dual benefit here because a lot of people do think that improving customer experience and you know improving operational efficiency have to be at odds with each other. And this is an example where they weren't because as you're going to see, all of our back office inefficiency was actually impacting the customer experience pretty significantly. So as we improve that, we could improve our cost and our own efficiency and it helped things for the customer as well. So that's what we were going after. The first thing we did was look at what we have in place today. And so if you think back to the MOVE example that I gave to you at the beginning of this webinar, we follow basically a similar process. We consulted a repository that in this particular organization we had created over a period of time, and it contained the blueprints. Uh, the high-level view, the pieces and parts of the business from a, both a business and IT perspective. And as we consulted that repository, we found out which capabilities are within scope. There were others. I mean, it's a simple you know, subset of the example here, but we found which capabilities are impacted. And then for those capabilities, we said, OK, and what's the ripple effect of those? We saw which business units um, are performing these capabilities, which value streams are communications being sent from, what information concepts are impacted, what applications are supporting those capabilities, and so on and so on. There are other pieces, of course, you could look at. And as, of course, you guessed, as we did this analysis, we found that many different business units were performing the exact same capabilities in different ways with lots of redundant people. And because of all of that, that was contributing to the high volume of communications that each customer received. So at this point, after we finished getting our arms around the pieces and analyzing, we realized that we needed to be able to tell a simple story to our customer experience leadership team. So to do this, we summarized the issues. As you can see here, we had various issues from the customer perspective like unclear and archaic format issues. We sent out too many communications and all on paper. We provided poor service because people worked in silos and you know the poor customer service reps couldn't even see an example of what had been sent to the customer. They had no visibility to that. From an internal business perspective, we found loads of activities and decision making that were that was uncoordinated, which led to redundant and conflicting results. So, for example, business units would send out communications with content and timing that actually conflicted with each other and gave conflicting messages. And we also learned that the systems, which were pretty old in this case, were inflexible. So, instead of doing something like creating a template for a communication to be generated from, let's say, a letter or something like that, the fields were actually hard-coded in systems so that if we wanted to do something like change a label on a field, it would take months in a formal IT project to change that. Okay, So this is just a way that we summarized, here's what we found, high level, telling the story. We also summarized the current state of performance, which in this case was things like what was being printed where and by whom and a variety of other performance measures. I will tell you that getting this data was a ton of work across the entire enterprise, but this was the first time in the history of the organization that they had ever seen a holistic view like this. No one knew the collective impact of what we were doing or how many millions of dollars were being spent just on printing alone, let alone all the operations to, to support that. So this is where I think um, <laughs> transformations like this are really exciting because once we really understand what we're doing, then we can make decisions and decide to go somewhere else. We 
visualize the customer experience, which was very siloed, disjointed, internally focused, inconsistent, all the things I mentioned before. And we did that using customer journey maps, which some of you are or a lot of you are probably familiar with, they're a popular way to represent how experience looks and feels from a customer perspective. And then we visualized our operations that were supporting all of this. So obviously there was lots we could have shared, but we focused on simple visualizations that really told the story and helped executives to make decisions. Um, this is, like I said, just a sort of a representative and simple subset of what we showed. There were basically all the layers of the business. We showed capabilities. We showed organizational views. We showed um, some, some representative processes that um, described how we made legislative changes to documents to illustrate some of the issues. We had application views. But even in a visual like this, as you're looking at it, you can probably see it doesn't look quite right or quite efficient. Uh, multiple business areas were generating the content that went on communications. Multiple of them did their own preparation, their own generation, their own delivery. So just think about in a big enterprise all of that redundant work. And then there was some inconsistency where a few business areas offered communication viewing electronically online through the website, but that was only available to customers. And the poor customers, if they wanted to see that, they actually had to navigate to different areas of the website depending on what product they were looking at. And then a few business areas also did some tracking. So certainly you yeah, see some issues with all of this. Once we had all of these visuals ready then, and we were ready to tell the story, we shared this current state with our customer experience leadership team. This leadership team was a pretty powerful concept. And I know a lot of organizations are starting to formalize around customer experience and put structures in place. But this structure worked really well. It was a cross-functional group of vice presidents from um, all the business areas that, uh, that were appropriate who were collectively responsible for the customer experience across the enterprise. So we presented to them. Um, of course, there was lots of socialization that happened with other leaders before we got to this level, but we presented. And when we shared what we found in this very holistic, very visual way, the leadership team was shocked, I would say, enlightened. Um, but the root causes for why we were having poor customer experience and, and inefficient was pretty clear. So after this checkpoint then, our next step was to design how do we want to do enterprise customer communications in the future. So this is where we move on to the where are we going part. So first we researched customer needs and wants. We researched what the competitors were doing. And we researched best practices, business and IT perspective, on how to manage customer communications. What's, what's possible? What are other people doing? We got this information from you know, industry analysts. Uh, there was an internal customer insights group that we worked closely with, subject matter experts in, you know, inside the company, outside the company. And we got key insights like customers really want to have things electronically, and they want to have the ability to set a preference for how and when they want to receive things. So all the ideas we got here and these best practices um, funneled into our future state then. We spent a good amount of time then rethinking, redesigning the future state. And now, basically, re we repeated similar steps as I laid out in the current state. So we defined and summarized the key concepts that would encapsulate our future. So from a customer or inside-out perspective, excuse me, outside-in perspective, future communications would have a consistent modern format we would actually capture preferences for how people wanted to receive their communications. We would create one area of the website where they could log in to see all of their communications aggregated together, not going to different parts on the website. And the customer service reps could see all of those things too and provide a very personalized, integrated service. From an internal or an inside-out perspective, our future design would have coordinated 
uh, business and IT activities and decision making across all areas, which is of course no small task to execute on, but it was the right vision to assert. We would build shared enterprise capabilities and solutions whenever it made sense, and we would build the systems in a way that they were much more agile, not the hard coding that we had done in the past. We, of course, redesigned the customer experience to be integrated and consistent. And then we redesigned the whole operational side as well at a high level. So some key points you can see here just to give you an idea of the process was in the future we asserted that all business areas should still generate their own content for communications, but all of the other capabilities should be centralized from a people, process, and technology perspective. In the future, every communication would get tracked and would be able to be viewed by the customer and the customer service reps in a central area. And again, like I said, we there's multiple layers. We showed all the relevant um, layers of the business at a high level as they would be redesigned. And we did it as sort of overlays or transparencies just to give you an example of one. Here's where we would lay the applications on top of our capabilities to basically show, um, you know, what what. Um, applications or set of applications, current or new, would need to be updated or built to support the capabilities as we had defined them. In this particular case, we needed to purchase a, a fairly large communication um, system that would enable us to perform multiple capabilities as you see them here. So then after we had defined the future state, we went back to the customer experience leadership team um, to share the future state. We presented the proposed designs so that they could see what was possible, so they could see what we were recommending would be centralized, see what the scope of applications was that needed to be developed, and very importantly, to understand the implications of the future state. because. A lot of people will sit in a room and say, yep, that all sounds good. Let's centralize that. That makes sense. But they need to understand implications uh, as they make those decisions. For example, in this case, a number of areas needed to give up some decision and making control um, in favor of a more centralized group that would be looking out for the enterprise. Or the roadmap that would need to be developed to execute on all this would require significant funding. So all those things are discussed, but the, the power is in the process and the visuals that help to drive leaders to consensus, make decisions, and have a common mental model of what the future would look like. No guessing, no different ideas in people's heads. And then the visuals that we created actually became a constant point of reference for everybody that was involved in this effort. You know, they would walk around with the current state and the target state and the roadmap, or you know, we would have these things printed um, and posted up on the wall. And we also used these documents when it came to governance activities and making decisions and reconciling things down the line as well. So after some iteration, we received approval from the leadership team and then went on really to do the last step we're going to talk about here, which is creating a high-level roadmap. So again, equivalent, you're probably tracking this to our move process that I presented earlier. But this, as you can see, is very high-level, very business-focused, and it tells us how are we going to go about accomplishing and breaking up that really big future state dream into pieces that we can deliver over time and in ways that we can continually be delivering value, not just you know building for years and waiting towards the end. The roadmap also gave us a business view of the work which we could measure progress against um, because in this case, you know, if sometimes the details and what we're working towards gets lost in the program and project level. Again, highly simplified view of what we actually provided here, but you can see key concepts like the fact that we developed different capabilities and stages over time. And then once we had certain capabilities in place, we started, um, you know, we'd put our transactional documents through them and then we put our correspondence through them so we were always um, rolling this out in pieces. There were peer business parts of the roadmap like setting up governance structure and processes to manage documents. And of course, change management is extremely important in all of this because um, this is huge enterprise change, as you all know. Um, so those incurred really throughout the entire initiative as well. 
and from here on out then, it was, uh, you know, again, that was presented to the leadership team. And then the execution work happened, right? And just for reference on timing of some of this, because you're probably wondering, wow, how long did all of this take? But the current state and the future state took us three months, and the roadmap took us another month. I think that is pretty agile. Again, when you consider the scope of what we did here, that's tremendous. Um, and then it's pretty much layers of an onion from there. So problem solving, designing, things like that got more detailed as we went along. And the detailed execution behind this was years <laughs> actually to implement it. But you could see how quickly we could get our arms around the problem just because we had the processes and, and the thought process in place. So I do hope this example has given you idea of really big things that you can accomplish once you commit to having some key information in place, good strategy to execution process, and enterprise collaboration at all levels. And the beauty of this process is that it does work if you invest in it and you allow it to. I think people get really anxious to get into implementation because it's something they're familiar with and they feel like they're making progress by executing and doing things. But the key point, just like it was for the move, is that you actually need to slow down to speed up. So I do like to leave people with some action items because the examples I've shared here have been enterprise level and in quite large. So just to share a few ideas with you, when you return to work in 15 minutes, what can you do with this information? Where can you start? So one thing you could do is find out how your strategy, architecture, planning, and execution functions and processes are working together. This can be a challenge, of course, if you don't have visibility to or relationships with the people and the functions. But if you do, you can start putting pieces together and you can start asking some questions and sharing some ideas of things that you learned today. If you have some sort of an enterprise planning process in your organization or some sort of a, a process that spans from idea to execution or something of that sort, then you're ahead of the game. But you can actually start there. Look and see how well that process is working and where can it be expanded and improved. And again, how can you infuse some of the ideas that I shared today into that? If the ideas that I shared today are really new to your organization, then introduce ideas when you can over time and within your span of control. Everything starts in small steps and gets bigger, as we know. So get some success, let the ideas spread, and then you can do bigger things. So for example, on your next effort, as you're doing that effort, try cataloging the pieces, like capabilities and business units and value streams and IT applications. Just get the pieces cataloged and relate them to each other. And for that scope, then, you'll have a foundation for yourself which you can reuse for impact analysis and other business insights. It's just, you know, step into this as it's possible. When your organization is ready for it, identify an opportunity to pilot something. Ideally, something that's cross-business area, like the communication example that I walked through. However, um, realistically, I will say taking on something of the size that I just explained is probably not a good place to start if you're new to the process, but it's, it's a place you can get to. Um, look for something with the same type of ideas on a smaller scale until the ideas and these sorts of methods becomes institutionalized and your organization is ready for it. And things to look for when you're looking for a pilot, obviously look for a sponsor who is open to new approaches, will advocate, um, look for something you can succeed at that is not too big in terms of scope. And finally, continue the learning process. Continue exploring what's possible, what sort of approaches you could utilize to get there. Um, obviously keep attending webinars like this. You're going to keep learning more in this space. And um, it's a journey, I think, is the important thing to know. So with that, I would like to thank you all so much for taking time out of your day today to participate in this webinar. 
I hope you found the information useful. I hope you have some new ideas, and I hope you have a broader perspective of what is possible. Um, I wish you the best of luck on your journey towards enterprise agility and collaboration, and I've shared contact details here if you'd like more information. So with that, Mike, I will turn it back over to you for questions and to close out. Thank you, Wendy. So a reminder to the audience, we have a couple of questions now, but uh, we, we welcome any other questions that people may have. To communicate those to us, feel free to use the questions tab located on the uh, GoToWebinar toolbar. To get things started, I'll ask, you've laid out some possible next steps, but how long does it typically take a large organization to put a strategy to execution process in place, as you've described it here, to the point where they could do something like the customer communications example that you shared? Yeah, that's a good question, probably maybe the million dollar question that's on a lot of people's minds. But again, just to reiterate, this is a journey. Um, I think in a large organization, if you had some serious focus on this, you can perhaps get there in three plus years to get everything really working. But the important thing to keep in mind, though, is even if you don't have the entire process working from end to end, you're going to be making progress in steps and getting value along the way. Now, the organization from which I shared that example started in the very smallest way that most people do. They started piloting these ideas on a very small scale in one business area. Um, and then when they caught on, years down the line, they could actually do something of this size. So again, to summarize, it's, it's a three could be a three plus year journey. I mean, it can be faster if you're efficient, but uh, sometimes organizations that are large it takes a little bit of a, a little bit of a while. Another question here: uh, Which are the best artifacts to best communicate your journey? Um, and just in terms of what we mean by journey, um, I'll, I'll answer that in a couple different ways. So if we mean specifically a customer experience journey, uh, there's actually an artifact called a customer experience journey, and there are life cycles and things like that. This is a bit of a new emerging discipline, and you actually craft out from a customer's perspective, what does each step um, when they engage with us, what does it look and feel like, and what do they um, experience um, in each of those steps? If you're asking from a bigger perspective of this entire journey and what are the relevant artifacts, I think it's to start with, the foundation is a repository of, like I said, the pieces and parts of an organization, key ones being capability, org, info, value stream, IT applications, and so on. And then from there, you do visualization. So when I was talking about what we were sharing with the leadership team, those were all visualizations out of a repository as well as just you know custom pictures that designers had done. And truly, I think the right artifacts are, are the ones I laid out, you know, a current state view of experience and operations, a target state view of experience and operations, and then a high-level strategic roadmap. Those are at least cornerstones to get you started. So the follow-up question to that was, what do you have to learn to be able to do this? That's a really good question. Very good question. I think some of the fundamental things to learn are you need to have a basic understanding, I think, of the big pieces of, generally speaking, what does strategy do? Generally speaking, what does an enterprise planning function do? Generally speaking, what does business and IT architecture do? And then how does that fit into solution development down the line. Obviously, that's a lot for someone to know. So this is very much a partnership and a collaboration to get something like this in place. I do think that um, like a business and IT architecture are pretty front and center. And so learning those disciplines will help quite a bit because architecture is really that bridge between strategy and execution and feeds into planning. So if you can understand how to you know, collect the pieces and parts and do some of these designs and think like this, then you can integrate with the other pieces. So I would probably start there. That's an excellent question. So another question here. Uh, similar to customer journey maps, have you found that service design techniques, i.e. service blueprints, not SOA, mm -hmm. are beneficial? Absolutely. Yep. 
Absolutely. And I think actually we may be saying similar things uh, along those lines. And like I said, this is actually emerging as, at least what I'm saying anyway, it's emerging as a discipline that enterprises are doing where they have a group of people that are responsible for designing experience and designing the services as you're saying, not SOA. Um, and then basically those experiences and services get operationalized through the business and IT architecture and, and other downstream execution. Another question, how detailed do your artifacts get? You mentioned business rules early in the presentation. Mm -hmm. It's all about where you are and what you're doing. So in the enterprise transformation I laid out, the reason why we could do current and future state in three months was because we started high level and we stuck high level. We did, and here's the key, just enough you know, analysis and representation and design to answer the questions at hand and not too much, right? Because as we all know, we could spend years designing and, and writing down current states. So you do just enough. And it's truly layers of an onion. Then when we were creating the strategic roadmap that I shared, we were actually doing a little bit more detailed analysis and design at that point to help inform us. And then it would be after that point, after that strategic roadmap, that you would get into things like business rules rules and, and so on. Um, and here's where you start to work with other disciplines, right? So for example, uh, requirements analysis, that's where you might do user stories which connect up to your capabilities. So as you can see, as you go down the line, it just gets more and more detailed and you don't go into detail until you need to, right? Until it's feeding into what you're trying to do. That's the key. That's what makes it agile and scalable. Great. Another question here. What are some key steps that an organization should take if they really want to get serious about improving the customer experience? I think there's a few things that you can do. The, I think the most important thing I'll focus on is this because in you know, the, the time we have here, I can't cover all of them, but really embedded into the organization. That's, I would say, the top recommendation I have. So, there should be strategic objectives around customer experience. You should probably eventually have some organizational structure or ownership that is focused on customer experience, whether that's a function which some companies have or a cross-functional leadership team, like that was the, the example I gave. It just gives credence and focus and ownership to this really important topic. Um, we've already talked about the experience design and the service design. I think that's another way to embed it. And then there's going a step further, which is creating a culture around customer experience and values around it and embedding it in the reward system. And when you look at some of the companies that are really good at customer experience and you know get awards for it and are written up by the research analysts, they live and think it and focus on it and are rewarded on it every day. And so it's, it's truly embedded. Great. Another question here. What metrics did you have to make or show to credit your process? Good question. So there are, we can look at this from different perspectives. In our particular case, just to kind of keep the answer simple here, it tied back to the objectives that we were tasked with. So there was customer experience, so that was measuring things like customer satisfaction and customer um, you know, indices around that. And then there was cost savings, um, right? As you remember, that was another one. And then there was literally pieces of paper. Those things are not necessarily easy to measure and isolate because of course you know just look at how you all voted in the first poll we're all doing loads of transformation and change so sometimes it's hard to isolate but it's worth spending time on figuring out how you're going to measure the success of this and that you keep going back to it um, year after year until the transformation is done I guess even after the transformation is going so sorry I'll give a high level answer to that one because that's a pretty deep one uh, let me see I have a question here about what is the difference between business architecture and enterprise architecture. Do you want to give your 30-second uh, version of that answer? You bet. So we would look at enterprise architecture as the broader umbrella. 
including business architecture and then the IT architectures, which would be like an application data technology. And Mike, I'll let you comment on that one too if you like. Oh, I mean, right, we could go on for hours about, <laughs> uh, you know, the differences here, but in terms of focusing on the, the, the business activities versus the architecting out uh, mm -hmm. all the pieces of the business's ecosystem, I think enterprise architecture has certainly evolved, you know, from John Zachman back in the 80s mm -hmm. where it was very IT focused. At this point, it has grown and been split where you have IT architecture, business architecture, application architecture, yep. strategy architecture, solution architecture. Mm, yep. um, so yeah, that's uh, that's probably six or seven different webinars. But um, indeed, I think <laughs> to close this out, I've got one last question here, where someone asks, "I missed a kind of feedback loop in your process. How did you cope with failures, e.g., the con the consumer of a product did not like uh, a part of your solution? Did you repeat a full cycle of as is to be planning?" <laughs> So we actually had the customer experience leadership team checkpoints were really important and they were short cycles as you can tell. I will say that the sort of layers of an onion process, there's always feedback loops. So as we learn more in detail, we can go back to back and shift. Uh, another way to do it is in the future state design. Instead of presenting one future state design, if we present multiple uh, for people to choose from, sometimes that's a way to do it as well. So. Sorry, just a really quick answer to the question. Sure. And with that, we've come to the top of the hour. And uh, so certainly, if people want deeper answers to some of these questions, uh, I'm sure you know Wendy's contact information is available there. Uh, the people at Mega, we're happy to speak to you as well. You can reach us at mega.com. Uh, otherwise, Wendy, thank you very much for a fantastic, fantastic presentation. This is very good. Uh, to the audience, I say thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you on future webinars. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you.